Mr. Long. Oh, how are you, brother? I'm good. It's good to see you. I tried to sell your hoodie on scarcity. Shit, have you got that? Did you bring it? <laughs> I did. Oh, man. I love that hoodie. Blue. I still got it. It's a blue it's one. It's a blue one. Yeah. How many times are we going to hang out and like not get my hoodie back? Uh, I'm using it as a ploy to get you back to Houston. You know. Do you know I've also got a pair of uh, rather expensive sunglasses there as well? Yeah, they're sitting right on top of the hoodie. Oh, they're my ones? Yeah, folded, oh. folded nicely. Oh, so no, I've got two pairs of sunglasses in Houston then. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I went, I went to dinner with someone and they picked me up in their car and I was like, right, I'm going to put my sunglasses in the side pocket of your car so I don't forget them. Went for dinner, forgot them, obviously. Obviously. I leave them everywhere. I bought a brand new pair on the way out here and lost them within a day. Mm -hmm. I stopped buying nice, expensive sunglasses because I just lose them. So I just buy $20, $20 pairs now. I just lose expensive ones. Uh-huh. Mm. Anyway, my boy did it. He went out to Kenya. He did his three months in mining. Yeah, I heard. I heard good things. Yeah, he enjoyed himself. Yeah. He went away a boy and came back a man. Oh, I heard they sweated the boyhood right out of him. If you're listening, Connor, I'm very proud of you. Actually, you'll be annoyed I'm talking about it, but whatever. Um, yeah, he had a good time. Good. It, it was uh, proper work mm -hmm. for a young man. That's right. Up every day, sweating it out, yep. building stuff with his hands. We call that in Texas character building. <laughs> it's been brilliant for him, honestly. Yeah. He came back a different guy. Oh, really? Completely different kid. Um, no, he didn't come back a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's kind of blown me away, actually. Since he's been back, he's like working with me again, but on it. He's up, he's getting stuff done. But the best thing of all, it's like the other day, right? So we're opening this cafe mm. for the football team. Mm. And uh, he, he had the fire guy in. Like my uncle's uh, uh, does fire uh, yeah. uh, safety. Yeah. Did the whole review, listed all the stuff. And Connor phones me up and he's like, Dad, um, there's a few things on the fire safety. Uh, the doors need changing. Uh, the old ones, and uh, he's reading this list, and he's like, "The electrical box hasn't had a service to, since 2017. Needs sorting out." And I was like, "Okay, well, look, don't go through with all with me now. Send me a list, and I'll tell you what to do." He's like, "Oh no, I've dealt with it, Dad." I was like, "What?" He said, "Yeah, I phoned up the landlord. They're going to replace the doors. They've got the electrical guy coming in. We'll get the certificate next week." And I was like, "Ha, huh. you are ready." Shout out Gridless. Shout out Gridless. <laughs> Shout out Eric and Phil from Gridless yeah. and everyone involved in Gridless. But that was a moment. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin's got a, mining especially, it's got a way of uh, straightening you out. I think there was two things happened though, right? I think there's another part of it. He went out there and worked. Do you know about his car before he left? Mm -hmm. He sold his car for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And while he was out there, the Bitcoin price was going up. And, you know, we're talking about this. And that led him to not just working in mining, but wanting to learn about Bitcoin. So he used to call me every day with questions. He's like, he said, Dad, why is there 21 million? And, you know, and uh, yeah, what is the halving? What's the difficulty adjustment? Like, going through all this stuff. And, and then he's like, Dad, how do I get more Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Because he comes back, right? And he's like, Dad, I want to I wanna buy a house. I'm like, cool. No, no. He says, I want to move out. I'm like, cool. Um, What's the plan? He's like, I'm thinking of uh, renting somewhere, but I don't know how to do it. So we get a piece of paper. I was like, okay, cool. We'll figure out your budget. Right. So you're, you're earning you know, whatever with me, let's say £20,000 a year. All right. How much is your rent? So he's like, £800. I was like, cool. How much is your car payment? It's like, £250. I was like, cool. How much is your insurance? 200 Cool. Uh, how much is your petrol? I was like, oh, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Maybe £100 a month. I was like, okay, cool. Um, well, okay, what about your insurance on your house? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, you need insurance on your house if something happens. I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. I was like, put that down. I was like, okay, what about your water bills? <laughs> what about your electric bill? What about your gas bill? I was like, what, you know, what are you going to save for clothing? Anyway, we did this budget. I was like, okay, so your take home needs to be this. So you need to earn £30,000 a year to move out. He's like, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, how do I do that? I was like, you work your balls off, you stay with me. You get to the point where you're on that money, you can move out. But like, it's it's been good. Teaching, teaching, teaching young kids. That's right, man. You seen what they want to do in the UK? Rishi Sunak, bring back national service. Oh, interesting. Oh yeah, I did see that. That was like a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to send. These How bananas kids. is that? It's um, <laughs> I got two views on it. Very strong views. Mm -hmm. My first view is 
for most of these kids, sending them into a military camp and making them make their bed and get shouted at and exercise every day would be brilliant for them. I agree. <laughs> but there is no world where the government should be doing this yeah. and creating war slaves. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's like 18 months though, right? Something like that. Something like that. I mean, they still have it. In it. Israel still has national yeah, service, doesn't it? For two years. Yeah. You got to be in the IDF, yeah. Yeah. Did they ever have it here? They must have at some point. Uh, last conscription, I think, was Vietnam. Right. Yeah, it's still there. Like they can activate it technically anytime. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe it's a sign that we're, we're going to war. Oh, look, that's a price we pay, I guess, for free speech. I don't know what you're paying, but I guess taxes. <laughs> uh, I pay a lawyer fees for free speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Shout out Craig for that one. Yeah, fuck you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking... Uh, anyway, we should talk about mining. Let's do it. And Matt Corallo on the show. Listen. Yeah. Good man, Matt. When, when yeah. Matt speaks, I listen. Yeah. If Matt is worried about something, I sit down and I listen. And he is saying minor centralization is definitely an issue, primarily at the pool level. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of pools is your miners, you point your hash rate at the pools, uh, the pool constructs the block, and they pay you out. And even we're less worried about a mine, uh, sorry, a pool having 51% than we are, say, a miner, because um, the game theory of the, theory of the pools is that they would destroy the, the, the network if they tried to abuse it. But is it really the same as, are, the, uh, are pools as threatening at 51% as an individual mining company? Uh, no. I would agree with Matt. So Matt, no, I, Matt didn't say that. That's okay, my understanding. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, I listened very intently to the Matt episode. He and I have a very storied past from <laughs> Bitcoin Classic, where he completely thrashed me till today. Got a lot of respect for him. Do you know what? You should explain that Bitcoin Classic thing first. Sure. Have so, you repented your ways? <laughs> indeed, I have. <laughs> so, uh, I guess it was twenty fifteen, maybe. We started this uh, series of discussions in a conference called Scaling Bitcoin, where people would present articles, papers, whatever, on their solutions. And uh, this was the first time fees were crazy. And so I wanted to turn a one to a two on the block size. Uh -huh. We had a bunch of these. We had one in Montreal. We had one in Hong Kong. And um, a friend of mine, Jonathan Tumum and Gavin Andreessen. Uh -huh. Uh, January of, I get the years mixed up, but uh, just said, hey, let's just build a client and let's just put it out there. So Bitcoin Classic was born and it was nothing but changing a one to a two. So it was a fork. Yeah, it was a fork after uh, Bitcoin XT failed mm -hmm. and my current read quit. Uh, Shout out to my hun. Yep. Yeah. Uh, your sacrifice is well noted, sir. Isn't he the only person who received Bitcoin from Satoshi? Yeah. Or did how? Uh, Mike didn't send it back, didn't he? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin Classic was like the precursor to what is now Bitcoin Cash. Um, and I, uh, yeah, ate a lot of crow, ran away for a couple years and built an esports company. Was it brutal? Like, how controversial was it? Because now it'd be hugely controversial. How controversial yeah. was it back then? So the way we did it was the reason it was controversial. Okay. You know, I called Brian at Coinbase and, you know, Winces and everybody. I was like, hey, can you like sign this website saying like you would back this? And of course we knew all the, the miners, right? So I was trying to like co-opt Bitcoin into... Oh, it's a hostile takeover. Uh, it was a hostile virtue signal, I would say. Okay. Um, and then it was pretty clear that, you know, then they had the USAF stuff, the US act, uh, user activated soft fork. Um, I'll tell you the person who taught me the biggest lesson, Adam Beck. Go. <sighs> he is a sly one. That guy knows how to run an open source project. That's for damn sure. So a uh, humbling experience because I thought lightning was too complicated and Segwit was too complex, all this and that, the third. So did classic activate? Oh, we never activated? No. Okay, so we got close. You build everything, got ready to go. Yeah. You had backers. Didn't happen. That's right. Okay. And then the project split into Bitcoin Cash 
And then that split into Bitcoin SV and yeah. Bitcoin Cash. And so at the time, were you seen, because I don't know this full story, were you seen as like the ringleader? Yeah, probably me, Gavin, and Jonathan. Um, and then the guy who quickly came in and helped us kind of orchestrate a little bit was Roger. So Roger was there day one with us and uh, Olivier. Huh. Yeah. So did you go through a period, I don't know all this story. I remember when we first met, I was here in Texas in a bar. Mm. You come up to me and said, like, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know your story. So did, were you like, were you like sent away? <laughs> Well, you, so people don't really understand what Bitcoin toxicity is because during those times, people were coming to my house. You know, I had to draw a gun on one guy who wouldn't leave. It's crazy. So like, that's why Bitcoin toxicity now, it's a joke. Like nobody's coming to your house, giving you a hard time about what you think. Right. So, you know, this big block versus small block debate, um, a good mutual friend, Obi, yeah. has a way better way of elaborating on why it's the wrong way to go about things. But uh, yeah, long story short, uh, I was wrong. I left the project after it came to Bitcoin Cash because it was very clear that I was wrong. Did you, did you, not that I give a fuck, but like there are people like, you should apologize. Like Wences is the only one who's apologized. Firstly, I don't give a fuck, but did you, did you have to come back and say I was, did you come back and say, look, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've said I was wrong many, many times. Yeah, fair. Um, I can apologize to anybody for what I thought. I mean, it's a yeah, network of exactly. people, right? So like, whatever. It's an idea. But um, it taught me very valuable lessons in how to operate in an open source community. Uh, it taught me a lot of things. And the interesting thing is I made a lot of enemies, but now everybody's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, once you open mouth, insert foot, you know, things just kind of get a little bit better. So, you know, now Bitcoin's rocking and rolling and I have way less concerns now. That I had back then. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're never going to fork like that again. No, that won't. Well, be that. that's not exactly true. I mean, I'm not going to throw people under the bus here, but like some pretty senior people in Bitcoin have said, look, probably one day we may have to. It might be a debate again at some point. You know, in in a decade or yeah, two it's decades. It's probably less internally stimulated, though. If I had to guess, it's probably more like, oh, there's a state actor trying. I think everybody would agree that if somehow a government had enough hash rate to mess with the network, we would fork overnight. Yeah. That would be easy. Yeah. So I think that's more likely than some kind of internal conflict. So the uh, it's it's funny that you had Matt on before because I think, and I've said this to him himself, it's easy for a developer to have an alarmist attitude about a lot of things. Like we've broken Bitcoin nine ways to Sunday by accident, you know? We've tried to break Bitcoin on purpose. That also didn't work. So... These things generally have a way of working themselves out. So I'm not so alarmist about it. So what was yours and Matt's background then? Yeah, we really got to know each other during the scaling days. Yeah. So during the block size wars. You know, Matt's a sm super smart guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is another person that just outwitted me on how to really engineer in a open source community. Hmm. Well, like I say, look, when Matt, Matt has a concern, yeah, um, I'm listening. Sure. Um, and the thing about this minor centralization issue, oh, let's go, let's go back. Like, what is, it's explained, what is the different uh, risk profile of pool centralization versus minor centralization itself, an individual mine having the hash power? Sure. So a pool is only as powerful as its constituents, right? So that's why if a pool has 51%, it's very easy for the members of that pool to fragment away, right? So this has happened before. Uh, the guys on one of your latest episodes, who was it? They were talking about it, ghash.io. I thought ghash was a miner. Was that a pool? It was a pool as well. Oh, so they were a miner and a pool. Oh, okay. Because they, well. <laughs> so the way, they, the way they worked is they had machines running and you could rent machines, you could rent hash rate from them, but they also had a pool. So their pool had 51%. I think they individually probably only had 10 or 15%. So when they hit 51%, before they hit 51%, they put out a notice. Yeah. They said, hey, we know we're getting close. If it happens, we'll split into two pools. So that happened, and they split into two pools. Okay, so they just they just made the decision themselves. There was no need to pressure them. That's right. Why, why, did, why, why, why have they disappeared? We even know why. So the biggest backer was Bitfury. Okay. I think Bitfury became less competitive over the yeah, years. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so 
we would worry about an individual miner having 51%. Uh, do we know of anyone's, like, what the highest hash rate? Because, like, Marathon, uh, Riot have just done their new deal, Iron, they're all growing quick. And, yep. they're, like, I trust those as companies. Like, yep. they, they have no incentive to fuck with the network. That's right. right. But at the same time, we still don't want to happen. Do we know who's got the most percent? Could you look this up, actually? Yeah, you won't be able to look it up. It's, oh, you it's can't. bit main. It's bit main. Directly. So, so, so they sell miners and mine themselves. Yeah. Do they mine their own machines before yep. they sell them? Because they so got... they don't mine them before they can sell them anymore. They used to. Yeah. Uh, what they do now is so the way you have to buy wafers from the foundry is you have to buy them before you sell them before you make them. Okay. So you buy a chunk of silicon. If you can't sell them due to price volatility or whatever, you're just left with stock. Oh, so they're just mining their unsold stock. Yeah. Huh. Well, it makes sense, right? Yeah, of course. Do we know? Do, do we have any idea how much power they've got? I reckon it's uh, north of ten. Okay, so but like, not nothing to be worried about yet. Uh, I'd say in the highest, it's twenty percent. Okay, fine, fine. So the biggest fear then is around Amp Hall, who yeah. themselves don't have fifty-one percent directly, but through them and their what is other pools pointing to their pool. So I'll give you two concerns I have. Yeah. So I told this story uh, of Ghash. To the Foundry guys. Foundry is by far the most popular pool because they're easy to sign off by an auditor if you're public yeah. in the States. And I said, you know, why haven't you guys publicly talked about this? You know, you've got a lot, you have the most hash rate currently, a visible hash rate, I'd say. What have they got about? Uh, 30%, I would okay. say. And their response is generally, well, all our actors are regulated, we're regulated, whatever. So we live in a different world now. I didn't, I see that. Now, the other side is this ant pool stuff. So I got a lot of love for the ant pool guys, but I'll tell you why, the, I'll tell you the issues and then how ant pool is trying to capitalize on those issues. So there's a few ways you can run payouts in pools. You can run what's called FPPS. That stands for full pay per share, which means every time my miner connects, and sends computation to your pool, I get paid as yep. a miner. Yep. So I have flat payouts. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, the miner, mining pool has to have a war chest to soak the variance because mining is a lucky game, basically. So that is very beneficial to large miners because they want to show consistent revenue. The other way to pay out is PPLNS, pay per last number of shares which means you get paid when the pool hits a block. Now, the pool game is all about attracting the most hash rate. PPLNS works if you have a lot of hash rate. But bigger miners are public. They don't want lumpy earnings. So it's it's a hash rate begets hash rate game. So they slowly die. Enter ant pool. Hey, we'll let you run FPPS. Just give us the back end. You can keep the front end. And here we are today. And why did ant pool do that? Because they've got the money. Ant pool's got the money. And running a pool is the worst business in Bitcoin, by far. Nobody will dispute that. Luxor guys would say that your margins are, at best, 2%. You can't run a business on 2%. That's why Luxor does things like their derivatives and their trading and their desks and all those things. Foundry does services and, you know, operations. Well, Harry Sudok said to me that in the end, uh, pools will trend to zero and that's they right. may even pay for your hash rate. That's right. So that's that's actively what's happening. So everybody's fighting over the hash rate. It's a smaller pie, less actors, and it's expensive to run a pool. You've got to have a bunch of nodes. I mean, you're, I think Luxor's, if I had to guess, Luxor's AWS bill is probably 200, 300K a month. Wow. Yeah. You can only pay that if you have a ton of hash rate. Because now it's a battle of fees. Everybody's trending to zero. So you got to supplement your business in other ways. So just a pool is the worst business of all time for Bitcoin. So now you've got to fight over customers. So now, now it's not just about fees. Now I, gotta, I can't do PPLNS anymore. So the only people who want PPLNS are people who want coins straight off the Coinbase with no history. So those would be the most, I would say, private coins you could have. Mm. Now, what Ocean is doing is a little bit different. They're making this marketplace so I could forward sell it. So it's still a PPLNS pool, but I could forward sell the my payouts. So there's ways around it, but 
that leads to, I don't have money to float the variants. Ant pool helped me out. Now Ant pool controls the back end for over 60% of them. And so what is the fear of what Ant pool could do if they went rogue? So like imagine, imagine you're new to Bitcoin, right? You've just heard about Bitcoin. You've Googled Bitcoin podcasts. You found this. The first show you listen to is Peter and Marshall or the second show. And you're like, all right, I don't, I, I don't know what you guys are talking about. All right, I know there's Bitcoin miners and I know they point their hash rate at a pool, but I don't understand 51%. I don't know what you mean. What is the risk here? If a bad actor has 51% of the hash rate, they would effectively be able to block out anyone else in the network from constructing blocks on top of their blocks. How do they block them out? I, I thought it was a case of, okay, talk, talk through how they do that. Sure. So if you have the majority of the hash rate, you effectively can find blocks faster than anybody else. Therefore, mm-hmm. you can propagate blocks faster than anybody else. Therefore, you can front run almost everybody else's blocks, which means then you get to censor transactions how you want, and everybody has to agree with it. So you effectively can control the consensus mechanism of the network. But but the other pools could still find a block before you. Sure. You've just got more. That's right. But is it because you've got more than half of the blocks? Yeah. So the, the reality is it's... Bitcoin is longest chain wins. Yeah. And so if I make the longest chain and it's not going to be 51 versus 49. It's going to be 51 versus 5 versus 10. So in this in that reality, I'm able to build a bunch of blocks and I can slap them on the chain all at the same time. And that's the new chain. Right. Whatever those rules are, whatever those block templates are, that's the new chain. And I can rewrite history if I want. Uh, it's a little bit more nuanced, but effectively, it would be much harder to go back and rewrite history. Would it not be a case of this would be a dominant party controlling the yeah. chain, but you, you, everyone can still be part of that chain, but it's it's like they own it. So by default, everybody would be on that chain because it's longest chain wins. Yeah. So let's say I have 51%. I find 10 blocks before the next block is found. A broadcast, here's these next 10 blocks. Everybody starts stacking on that chain. Now you've created a fork. And from this fork, you effectively can create the rules from then on out. So that's the concern. Does it, the reality of it, is it better? Is it significantly better at 60 and then even considerably better at like 70? Yeah, the odds of getting it right at 51 are much less than. You know, 65. I think Matt even wrote a paper that it's it's more economical to do it at 70 or something like that. Yeah, that's what I've heard. It's more yeah. economical at 70 and being able to maintain it. Yeah, that's right. But if if you hit 51 and you started to kind of screw around, yeah. people will know very quickly they yep. can move the hash rate. And, you know, the market's quick to respond. Exactly. So this 51%-ish they have, whether it's 51, 50, 60, whatever, where will that be coming from? Uh, a large part of their own, so it could be... 20% their own, 10% their own. Would that just be just a random number? Could it be a large US public miner? Could it be uh, you know, a number of smaller miners? Could it be a gridless? Like, I'm, I'm not saying specific names, but sure. like, is it just random? It would be an amalgamation of different, different groups. And do you think these groups are the kind of people who all completely understand what's going on in Bitcoin? And if, if, because people are very good at studying the chain and what's sure. going on. Sure. And so if Ample did start to screw around the chain, there'd be a very quick reaction. It would be quick. So let me tell you... How quick can you repoint your hash rate another pool? Uh, 100 milliseconds. Oh, it's that easy. Yeah. So let me tell you the kind of incentive, instruction, incentive structures that are there today. So, for example, via BTC. They're back in his Ant pool. But via BTC also has a venture arm. So their CEO, big-time businessman in China... Great guy, got a lot of love for him, but they have this venture arm. So if they invest in your mine or they finance your machines, you have to mine via BTC. That's part of the trade. However, the back end is run by Ant Pool. Hmm. So you're somewhat commingled to Ant Pool through via BTC because via BTC gave you money. Okay, so that's an example of an actor who would contribute, 
who is contributing to this ant pool dominance currently. Whether or not they know it, they're contractually obligated for some amount of time to mine to via BTC. But via BTC, if they saw this, they'd, they're the kind who would just move the hash rate very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the reality is the guys at Ant Pool have been in the game as long as me and longer. There is no incentive to hurt the network, but that doesn't mean they can't. And I think that's where Matt is. Uh, that's where Matt sees it from is the potential is there for them to flip a switch and hurt the network. That is true. The incentive is not there. Would they do that? I only know them personally, so well. The economic is, incentive is not there. But where is Ant Pool based? They're Chinese. Okay, sure. So there's a few countries that I would list, put at the top of the list of places where would potentially the state, sure, could they and would they knock on a door and say, "Hey, we want you to do X." So I would put China on one of those just because. Don't doesn't the Chinese state own fifty percent of every company anyway? Or yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we're essentially saying the Chinese state owns twenty five percent of the the pools if they've got fifty percent. Sure, I, I mean most of the devs are in uh, Korea and Thailand, but yeah, I mean technically they could apply pressure, I guess. But yeah, executing that would be much more difficult. I think the reality of getting that done is not just getting a knock on your door. But they could be a period of planning. Okay, so if sure. it came down from the state, yeah, maybe you got a guy that like embeds into the team and you know works his way up. Yeah, or they do knock on the door and say, "This is what we're going to do. If you don't follow this, you're all, you we're going to jack- disappear. Yeah, we're going to jackmail you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. so if they're willing to disappear, the richest, most successful businessman or one of them, sure. in, they'll do the Absolutely. Too. Okay. I don't know the government's incentive, but but I see a scenario where a huge amount of business and opportunities in the U.S. Uh, there's wars over chips. Um, there's the foundry out in Taiwan they want access to. Um, there is a huge amount of Bitcoin capital that sits in the U.S. There is these ETFs that are, like there is. Of the 1.5 trillion of the network, how much is owned by Americans, American companies? I don't know, but it's going to be a double-digit percentage. Yeah, it's probably over half. Yeah, so it's going to hurt America. Sure. And so there may come a time where it's a $10 trillion network or a $50 trillion network, and the Chinese government are like, well, you, you're banning our exports and our imports, and you know, you're banning our your staff from work in our company as well, we're going to fuck with your network. It's, it's not an implausible scenario. I agree. It's to me is the Bitcoin version of what the US did to Russian treasuries. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, so I'd put, I'd put America, uh, sorry, uh, China on that list, but I would put Russia on that list and I would put the US on that list. Sure. They're probably the three jurisdictions, the superpowers, who at some point could have an incentive. Whether the US one is a deep state incentive to kill Bitcoin because it's competing with the dollar. But at the same time, if Foundry got to that point, they could get a knock on the door. Sure. Yeah. So we just want to avoid this. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to get away from it. So the, if I look back at history at times that the network has been under, distress, mostly due to accidents. I feel like the same kind of operation would happen. I'll give you an example. 2013, I think. Uh, Core pushed an update. Update was bad. Caused a fork. The fork was identified. The fork was corrected by the miners changing the block template back. All within two blocks. Amazing. Because once we saw it, we literally all just got on a Skype call and just were like, yeah, let's fix this. So I would say most, When that happens, sorry, when that happens, does it go back to before those two Yeah, blocks, you roll it back. You roll it back. Yeah. And what happens to what's happened in those two blocks? Do they just go back into the mempool? Yeah, it's like they never happen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, they can be remined. That's right. So they, that's they, only if the network effectively colludes to do that. And the economic incentives are always there yeah. 
for economic we players. We want to make sure Bitcoin's not broken. Yeah. So let's all jump on a call and do it. Yeah, cool, cool. So Matt sounding the warning early. Yeah. He thinks it could be existential within five years. In a hyper-Bitcoinization period where the network increases in value, purchasing power by 10x, it's not a scenario that's unfeasible. It goes from 1.5 to 15 trillion. We would be we'd be better placed to be in a position where this is not an issue. Let me tell you the what probably happens. Yeah. Amp pool is in a place, let's say foundries in a place, whoever. They start doing weird things. The network wouldn't first result to collusion or roll a chain back. Miners would just simply pull their hash rate away. So where we get into bigger problems is where, let's say, Foundry and Riot and Marathon and Clean Spark all get a knock at the same time. Okay, this is a knock on the door for miners. This isn't a pool issue. That's right. Okay. So now Foundry and Marathon and Clean Spark can't pull their hash rate away from Foundry because they're told they have to. That's right. So that's more scary. Okay, let's come back to that though. I'm going to write that one down. Um, Okay. We'll stay on the pool one. So yep. with the if if Ample start doing weird things, people know this straight away. If a if a Skype call needs to happen, if a Zoom needs to happen, um and you got the ten people controlling the most hash rate or influence amongst other miners, how much hash rate can you get on that phone call? Uh we could probably get 70% of the hash rate right. on a phone call. And it's like, okay, you point at Foundry, you point, you point at F2 pool, you point at here. So yeah. everyone just like repoints, yeah. delegates, problem solved. Yeah. And it's a nice warning. Let's book another meeting next week. How the fuck do we figure this out? But then a lot of people will say, well, that's the problem. So if you remember scaling Hong Kong, we were on stage, 90% of the hash rate was on the stage. Yeah. Everybody knows each other. It's a small group. And so a lot of people have a concern that mining is still centralized because you could have a 70, 80% hash rate phone call tomorrow. Like that's easy. And it's not because there's nefarious intent. It's just we're all homies and we grew up in Bitcoin together, you know? Well, the reality is proof of stake gets a very valid criticism of centralizing. Yeah. It gets a very valid because the economic incentives are. For, well, I mean, I, I was told the conspiracy that the reason we went to proof of stake was entirely because the Ethereum Foundation thought, huh, well, if we if we go to proof of stake, we're going to make a shitload more money That's because right. we hold so much Ethereum. But like, it's a it's a it's a proof of stake is great for large volume holders of Ethereum and any other proof of stake network because you just continue to get paid for holding. Right. It's it's bullshit, right? It's the rich get richer. Rich, yeah, it's uh, yeah. It's inflation. It's socialism for the rich. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. And so, uh, like, that makes sense. The economic incentives mean that proof of stake doesn't work. The economic incentives for mining also have clearly led to a centralization. Sure. It is a perfectly linear business model. Yeah. The more I deploy, the more I can make. Not other businesses are like that. I don't have a customer. My network is the customer, right? So I always have... It's like a commodities business with zero transport cost, right? It's a bit like, you know, when the government steps in the monopolies and I want to break companies up. Yeah. It's like what GHash did. Yeah. It, it kind of feels weird that, that you kind of want it to happen here. It's sure. almost like if Marathon got so big, Fred yeah. T was like, cool, we're going to split us up Stop into... Stop being so good at your job, yeah, please. Get worse. But like split up into two, you, you, two separate companies... You know, and have a you know governance structure means that you cannot do certain things the same. Get all the same economies of scale, but like parts of your business, the centralizing parts, which is location, yep. mining pool, yep. you have to you distribute those parts. Well, now let me give you the counterpoint. There yep. could be some benefits. Don't skewer me for this one. Yeah, but yeah. Marathon is big, therefore they can offer interesting products. Like Slipstream just came out, right? Which mm. is their out of band payments thing. What do you think about that, by the way? Uh, I would say so. I tried to build this five years ago. 
I built an API that different pools could connect their mempools together and you could shove transactions to it. So Slipstream is just giving customers the ability to do what I've been doing for a long time. I'll give you an example. A year ago, I found an old open dime that had like 2,000 inputs because I was mining to it. And it wasn't much Bitcoin, but the fees were like 2K, which is like double what the amount of Bitcoin was in there. Right. So I redeemed it, made the raw transaction hash, called one of my friends that runs a pool, said, hey, can you mine this for zero fee? Sure. Boom. Done. I did a favor for buddy. Yeah, that's right. Now Marathon is saying, if you want to do these non-standard transactions, here's a portal to do that. Yeah, but I, I don't think they're doing it for that scenario. They are making, over the past 90 days, they have made 8% more mining these non-standard transactions through Slipstream. Well, what do you think those scenarios are? Because uh, your buddy's done you a favor and, sure. and lost money. Yeah. And so that's cool. Love that. Um, it's like someone coming into my bar and me giving them a drink for free, right? You do that for you. Yeah. But, but he didn't have an economic incentive to do that. For a marathon to do this is an economic incentive. Yeah, that's right. So what are the transactions they're doing for people? So I looked at the transactions over the past 90 days or so. Um, most of them are JPEGs right. um, that they're shoving into blocks. Which look, as a free and open network, you could shove whatever you want through it, but it's also up to the miners to mine it. Yeah. So you want to send a crazy transaction, maybe you have to pay more for it or whatever, maybe people don't want to mine it. You could do whatever you want on this chain. It's hmm. open and permissionless, right? So for me to tell you that's dumb or silly is besides the point. You can do it. It's within the rules. Go for it. And with Slipstream, they're just constructing a block yeah. and ignoring the mempool. Uh, they are allowing people to put non-standard transactions that are still consensus conforming yeah. into uh, blocks for a fee. Yeah, but but why would the person put it in, go through Slipstream rather than send it to the mempool? So it'll probably be mine faster. Might okay. get a slight discount overall based on maybe I, I put this giant four meg picture into a block. Maybe people don't want to mine it or the fee that I'd pay might take me like three weeks to get that mined or something like that. So the other thing is depending on what the network is running, okay. maybe I can't even broadcast that transaction. All right. Let's let's go to what you talked about with knock on the door, four miners at the same time. Point that shit at Foundry. Yeah. Keep pointing that at Foundry. Yeah. How much hash rate is in the US right now? It's between, I would say, 40 and 60%. So it's high. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's the most. And the trajectory is getting higher That's right. and higher. That's They're right. all building out, yep. building new places. Yep. It could get 70, 80%. It's great for America in the world where everyone accepts and loves Bitcoin. It's great for Bitcoin in a world where everyone is an honest actor. It's bad for Bitcoin in a world where the signal that has come certainly from the Biden administration is we've got some issues with Bitcoin. Yeah, certainly the Elizabeth Warren wing of the Biden administration where it's like, we want a little, this is something we can't control. <laughs> we want to control everything. That's right. We want to control what you say, think, do. We want to see every transaction you do. We want to know every part of your company, every part of your business, everything you spend over six hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, we want to know everything. Um, how the fuck are you invent this this thing where we can't do it with? So, you know, ETS are good for them. They got a bit of control over that. Yeah, regulated exchanges with KYC are good for them. They got a bit of control over it. Banning self custody. It's a nice bit of control. Well, how do we control the miners? Why do we want to control the miners? So if I could control the miners, mm -hmm. I could just say, let's say I could control the pools. I get to say what transactions I allow. Those OFAC ones? Yep. They're not happening. Actually, we want to, we want to cut China off. That's we don't right. Want China using Bitcoin. If they're coming from this IP, this address, don't include it. Yeah, no Iran, no Russia. That's right. Yeah. And then Bitcoin is no longer... Censorship resistant. That's right. Okay. So the mining sector is the attack surface for that. Because despite what a developer would tell you, and this is a, a direct shot at Matt, miners still run the network. So we get to say what goes into a block and what doesn't. Yeah. Right? So if somebody's co-opted me, there's that. 
If you want to go one level deeper, you can get down on the chips. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how many? Well, so chips are essentially what ninety percent coming out of Taiwan. Yeah. So right now you've got uh, these are the companies taping out from Taiwan: Ardine, Bitmain, uh, uh, Avalon. Okay. Uh, what's minor microBT? They're using Samsung. Where are they? Where's their foundry? So Samsung's got a few foundries. Okay. They've got uh, one in Taiwan. They've got one in Korea. They've got one in Japan. They've got one in the States. And IBM are working on chips? Yeah, and Intel. And Intel. And they're purely chips for uh, 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 Bitcoin ASICs? Uh, or they're building a new foundry? They're building foundries. Oh, and, and so the foundries are irrelevant to the chip types. Once a foundry exists, right. they can make chips. But it's like a decade to build a foundry or something? Well, there's there's competition. So currently the three most competitive foundries are Intel, uh, TSMC, and Samsung. Yeah. Now that just gives them the technology to make chips. Now there is a huge discrepancy between those three. TSMC is by orders of magnitude better in efficiency, yield, what you get off the chip, how good it is how many dead engines you might have on the chip, all those things. TSMC is by far and away the greatest chip manufacturer of all time. Now, they're building one in the States. Got a huge tax incentive to do that. Because we're worried about China going to war with That's Taiwan. Right. Here's where it gets interesting. The CHIPS Act, which you've heard about, mm -hmm. has effectively blocked companies that have majority Chinese ownership from getting access to the newest process nodes on TSMC. Right. It's a soft, a soft declaration of war. Yeah. So, and haven't they also blocked uh, c c like researchers and scientists working for Huawei? Yeah. Yeah. But a, a few companies, I thought, yep. as well. So it's, it's interesting now because now you've got companies uh, that are building ASICs that are not Chinese. So you've got Ardine and Chain Reaction. And these companies, so Ardine's American. Uh, chain reaction is Israeli. They get access to the newest, latest, and greatest TMC TMC stuff, but Bitmain might not. Right. So now you get to see this bifurcation of, okay, let's say Ardine's got the best chips now because they get access to TSMC two nanometer, right? But Bitmain, you're stuck at four. So now you get to see a market shift to the latest and greatest. Let's say Ardine's got the best machines. Okay, great. Now you want to work out the game theory of that. Now the control of the network has shifted from a Chinese company to say an American company or Israeli company. Now they can start applying pressure more easily. Does this mean the A6 are better than the Bitmain ones? Yeah, basically that means if you're... But is that actually happening? Like if you're a, you want these A6 ahead of Bitmain ones now? Uh, not imminently, uh, not this year, but... Q3, Q4, there's going to be some really big announcements and they'll be available in large quantity in 2025, at least from Ardine. I'm not so sure about the chain reaction guys, but as that progresses, right? So we're basically at the edge of the fork right there for that, where you should be seeing, especially when Intel gets their new foundry up, you should be seeing American companies getting an edge on technology availability to ASICs. It's a wild world where, where Bitcoin now is, uh, you, you're starting to see like the geopolitical influence on Bitcoin at so many different levels. Yeah. It's fucking wild. Man. Now, here's the good news. Okay. Mining has always and will always be the seeker of the most inefficient energy. Always. So when I started mining, it was wherever. Then we moved to Washington State. Washington State at one time had like 40% of the network. Then we got kicked out of there. We moved to China. China had over 60%. Got kicked out of there. Now we go back to the States. So that, that's one of the coolest stories I have in Bitcoin is mining in China. And then all the Chinese guys coming back to Texas, I give them all AR-15s and cowboy hats. <laughs> They're like, Ugh. <laughs> them sending me videos of them hog hunting and stuff. It's great. Uh, but now you're seeing a lot of things in like South America, Paraguay, 
Bit Farms has a huge place in Paraguay. That's off the dam, isn't it? Yeah. Did you see the thing though, where the Paraguay the riot, hostile takeover? Yeah, but it. But I did read they hadn't paid a bill or something. No, or Paraguay permission. Yeah. What was yeah, that? About? I'm not sure of the regulatory issues in Paraguay. I've never been. I've only mined in Brazil, so I'm not. But they went in with guns and took the Asics. Uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. That, yeah. I yeah. Yeah. That. No, I saw something. Crazy. I don't know which mining company it was. Oh, okay. Um, but it was in Paraguay. Oh, it's Paraguay. Yeah. It was probably an illegal op, maybe. Well, they said it was illegal energy use, I think. Ah, uh, like uh, like grid siphoning or something. I don't oh, know. Oh, I did see that. I don't think it was a public company, though. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Paraguay seizes nearly 400 Bitcoin mining machines and more than 5,000 ASIC mining machines have been confiscated this year. What does that even year. mean? That's literally the same thing. Oh, no. That's 400. I mean, it's the same thing, but 400... And then more than 5,000 in a year. According to O Daily Planet, Paraguayan authorities have seized nearly 400 Bitcoin mining machines in the city of Sapake. I'll probably pronounce that wrong. The operation was carried out jointly by the police and National Electricity Administration as part of an investigation in suspected energy theft. Earlier news, the Paraguayan government urged lawmakers to pass a bill to impose up to 10 years in prison on illegal Bitcoin miners in response to the massive theft Does it say of who energy. It is? Uh, the bill provides Paraguayan police and prosecutors have the right to confiscate and sell illegal mining machines to protect uh, and from huge economic loss caused by energy theft. Yeah, this just seems like yeah. uh, some undercover miner. Yeah, well, so either undercover miner or someone's just done a private deal with an energy company. It's like, oh, hold up, well, you know, with the government here, we you want to have a license. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, five thousand machines—that's a lot. Yeah, and look, if you know, let's be fair on this stuff. If an energy company starts pointing energy at mining company, uh, mining assets rather than away from houses, right? <laughs> you know, you can understand government sure. influence. So, like, did you play by the rules? If you if you can find a company, the actual company is that would be interesting. I just saw yeah. it up on Twitter, yeah, and like some guy said, look, it's state overreach in Paraguay, and somebody commented below, it's like it's energy theft. Like, what the fuck are you on about? Yeah. So, uh, in those kinds of markets, you're starting to see even more hash rate deployed. Across Ethiopia, you know, I just started a big mine in Nigeria, uh, Marathon in Kenya. Yeah, well, that's an MOU. So, what's an MOU? They signed an MOU, which is a Memorandum of Understanding. Oh, okay. So let's let's talk. So, so Africa is they notorious. Asked them date. Yeah, Africa is notorious for that, announcing MOUs and not much gets done. So I don't know the details of that one specifically, but it's not they're not deploying tomorrow. Let's just mm. say that. What we need is more. Yeah, uh, Western liberal democracies to understand the benefit to the energy infrastructure, so we get more distribution. Like we know in the UK, the amount of uh, energy that is curtailed. Oh, it's different miners. Okay, uh, it's probably independent. Then, yeah, isn't a bunch it? Yeah. of small people. Yeah, but um, yeah, so we don't really have much money in the UK. I think there's a little bit of a skilling in out in Ireland, but yeah. the incent the, the energy is too high, even though they wasted it. But like, if the UK government went, hold on a second, we're missing a trick here. You know, you would rather have your miners in UK, France, Germany, US than you would in Paraguay, Ghana. Yeah, absolutely. You Somewhere where you've got nice rule of law. It's more stable government. That's right. Yeah. But mining is always trended to more risk, cheaper power. Okay. So, you know, the mine in Nigeria, for instance, I could wake up tomorrow and it's all gone. <laughs> yeah. But that was my same reality mining in China. Yeah. You know, so the the... For me, it's old hat. Make sure you have good partners. Make sure the community is incentivized with you. You know, very similar in a different way to what you're doing in Bedford, where you want you want all the homies to eat with you. You know, oh, fuck yeah. And so, if you can set that structure up, it's good for me. But there's no way in hell I would take money from friends or family because the reality is still there. You might wake up, all your employees got their hands chopped off, and all your machines are gone. You know, that's that is a, a, a risk potential. You're not going to have that in the UK. Maybe you'll get an acid attack at your farm or something. But. Yeah, was it Baku Haram? Is that the yeah, Boko Haram? Boko Haram. Haram. Guys, they yeah. might come come with their guns and say, yeah, Absolutely. we want that stuff. That could happen. Yeah. However, for me, the risk-weighted reward is almost free power. Almost free. So mining has always sought out those places and is inherently becoming more decentralized for that. Now, as far as large places with rule of law, they haven't figured out that because I can turn a Bitcoin mine on and off so fast, it actually makes the grid way better. But they're getting there. Now we've got 
Texas ERCOT doing the marketing for us. We don't even have to do that. It's great. They're putting out papers. Oh, this this storm, here's how the miners helped. Graphs, all that with proof. That's the regulator saying that. So I think over the years, you'll get more and more of that. It's effectively a better battery where it can soak, you know, the inefficiencies. So in time, I think we'll get there. Maybe we're a decade or two out from that, but... Well, let's let okay. There's levels to this. That's let's, right. let's start at the chip level. It, the chip level feel really does feel like it. Uh, it is a geopolitical solution. And it's always been like that. Yeah, not just for Bitcoin. And and even and it's going to become even more important with the, the, this massive growth in AI. Yeah, I mean we've been covering AI in the show as well. We covered it with Iron because they've got the GPUs. I covered it uh, with Natalie Smolensky. Yeah, I listened to her. God, uh, she's smart, isn't she? Dude, she's like the fucking crazy. Best. Honestly, every time I sit there, there's a few people that every time I sit with them and I talk to them about something, we go up the subject head on, right? Mm. And then there's a few people, they go around the subject and they come in the back with something I haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Suduk does it. Yep. Harry is like, like... Don't you just hate him for having that voice too? <laughs> yeah, he's got the sexiest voice in Bitcoin. <laughs> but I'll say something to Harry and I'll, like, I'll be very... Like I've thought about something, I've thought it through and I'll be like really sure of it. You're right there. He'll come around the back and he'll say... And he'll cut this whole other angle I've never even thought about. I was like, how the hell does your brain work? Mm -hmm. Parker Lewis does it. Yeah. But he, Parker, I know what level, he, everything he's done at um, the economic incentives level. But everything, he's like, his brain has this layer of economic incentives and he passes everything through it and comes out with the answer. And then Natalie Smolensky is one who does it as well. Um, but she knows everything about everything. She's yeah. like this giant book. Um, but I just love talking to her about governance uh, uh, rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, but we did the whole AI thing, right? Um, and she was explaining these, uh, uh, like these base model AIs, mm -hmm. the amount of energy they need, the infrastructure they need to, to do the baseline computation. And I'm sure on the show the other day, Rogan did with these two AI guys, the safety guys, they were talking about like one state is I think, I could be wrong, but I'm sure they were talking about a moratorium on AI because the amount of energy it's using. Uh, and I was also just thinking, well, chips, the GPU chips. And so like where we're heading with Bitcoin and AI, we're heading into a world of really having to think about chips and power, mm -hmm. which is a geopolitical thing. Absolutely. You know, if, <laughs> if we're blowing up pipelines, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm worried about global warming. Chips and power become become two important things. But like the chips thing will be solved at the state level, I believe. My assumption is, correct me if I'm wrong if you know, but f foundries, the, the establishment of foundries is a relationship between these huge chip manufacturers and governments. It's the US government saying, IBM, we need a foundry here. TSMC, we need a foundry here. What do you need from us? Now here's the, the answer is yes, however, there's one other third actor that has to be involved. Yep. ASML. So ASML is the is a Dutch company that makes the machines to make the best chips in the world. So TSMC buys a four hundred million dollar high NA EUV machine. Yeah. From ASML. It's only the Dutch company that yep. makes sense. And, and that Dutch company works with Zeiss to make the lenses. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty cool with Dutch companies. I'm not yeah. too worried about that jurisdiction. And a lot of people say, well, why couldn't a Chinese company make that? Let me tell you how psychotic these ASML machines are. In order to produce the laser at the right frequency to make the chips at the highest process nodes today, they're shooting droplets of tin in the midair, striking that with a laser, and then using the diffraction off of that tin particle to make the laser beam. <laughs> and they do that 50 times a second. I mean, I can't even quantify it, but it sounds insane. It's insane. But I don't think... So ASML is now barred from selling those machines to anybody that effectively the US government doesn't say can have this machine. China and Russia yeah. and Iran. Yeah, that's right. The axis of evil. That's right. Um, okay, so like we can't really do much as a Bitcoin community here because it's not just a Bitcoin issue. This it's is a, a this it's is just a, chips. Yes, yeah, just chips, and you know we just create the demand. Uh, we're part of the the demand. That's right. Okay, so we, we go a step down. A six sounds like it's becoming more decentralized. Yep, I think it's becoming more decentralized. There's 
there was a period of Bitcoin where everybody and their dad was going to come out with a chip. And, you know, I personally have reviewed like over a dozen, like the first step in a chip process called the RTL. I've reviewed over two dozen RTLs probably in my time. Almost none of them see the day of light, a light of day. However, now you've got very serious companies with very serious founders who have done real serious stuff. So like the guys at Chain Reaction, they sold a $4 billion company to NVIDIA, right? You got the guys at Aridine who started Palo Alto Networks, right? Who run all the networking in the world. So these are serious teams that are very serious money and are not Chinese. And nobody that works there is a Chinese citizen and they're all inside the States and they're making competitive hardware now. So that's where you get finally the first time ever in Bitcoin where you see some diversification. And there was a company called KNC for a while, Bitfury for a while, but they all fell to the wayside. They don't have the, the state of the art for Bitcoin ASICs now is a Bitcoin chip on the surface is very simple. It pales in comparison to a GPU or CPU. However, now the actual designing mechanisms that you have to use, you got to have some real bona fide guys to get that done. And now you finally have some teams being formed, shipping products. You know, our Ardine's already shipped thousands of units. So there's real competition now outside of the Chinese borders. That's becoming a little bit more interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the miners themselves and the pools, how we solve or fix this. Okay, so with the miners themselves, isn't, is, is there ironically a situation where mining itself becomes more decentralized because state actors start mining? Yeah, that's interesting where they start racing each other. Yeah, right? it's like an arms race. Yeah, so Iran's an interesting case study there. So Iran has, as a country, started mining. Russia as well. UAE as well? Yeah, the guys at uh, Zero Two are backed by ADQ, which is a state-owned company. Bhutan? Yeah, Bhutan. They just announced a big one, Kazakhstan. Yeah. So uh, having state-sponsored is like, the, the ones who have really been public about it, if you're smart about it, like let's take El Salvador, for example. You can have your own federal mint inside your country. Yeah, off a volcano. And, and that is money that is not only accepted in one place. You're not printing dollars. You're printing currency that you can spend anywhere. It's like the biggest fuck you to the Fed ever. Mm. And so most of the countries are doing that now. It's like, uh, no thanks, we don't need this IMF, right? Um, there's some companies or some countries like Suriname and uh, Dominica. They'll they took a, they'll take Dominica for example. They take a hundred fifty million dollar loan from the IMF to build a power plant, but they don't get money to build transmission. So they got this power plant. The IMF expects them to come back and say, okay, we need money for transmission so they can keep feeding the beast. But now they have a power plant. Slap a Bitcoin mine on it. They could pay for their own transmission. And so they just have to go to the well one time and they can opt out of the IMF after that. It's, it is so insane. I mean, look, I remember the first time I got Bitcoin in 2013, but I didn't get into Bitcoin. I just got Bitcoin. I like, bought some. And then I started getting into it like Jan 2017. But even then it was like, yeah, there's kind of like this little nerd thing online. Some, you can send this like digital currency back and forth to people. And... In seven years, we've gone to that. From that, we have governments mining it. We have it on the ballot sheet. We have presidents talking about self-custody. And I always try and think, why has it worked? Like, how has this happened? And, and you know, Parker Lewis always says, everything about Bitcoin is downstream from 21 million. Every single thing is downstream from that. That is why Bitcoin works. And you try and think that. It's like, you can invent money with one specific rule and it changes the entire world. And the fact that it's happened so quickly, yeah. when I got into Bitcoin, I thought it was illegal because in the US constitution, it says you can't make your own money. In mm. 2010 mining, I was like, oh shit, this is like, so I was very private about it. And then, you know, I can remember very specifically going to money 2020 and 2013, I sat on a plane next to some Western Union exec. She's like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I, I do Bitcoin. That's drugs, right? <clears throat> and then we go into, well, we thought it was illegal, and then it's drugs, and then it's, oh, that's like money laundering, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's like, oh, yeah, it's like nerd money. And now it's like, it's the fastest growing ETF ever. Uh, there, 
there's been times, right, when like people say, Pete, what do you do for work? Yeah. The, the best scenario of this is maybe on a date. And they're like, yeah, so what do you do for work? I was like, oh, I have a, I have a podcast. What is it about? And I don't want to say. You don't want to go down the hole. Because they're like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah. It's like, it's, there, was that, there was a time there was like a trifecta of veganism, CrossFit, and Bitcoin. <laughs> and occasionally you'd find one dude who does oh. all three, like, you're a douche. Yeah. Uh, and it, so I used to say, oh, it's just economics. Yeah. Like, oh, what do you mean economics? Well, I talk about money and, you know, like, like sometimes we look through the lens of Bitcoin and then you can get them in. But I didn't Engaging. want to say Bitcoin because they were like, yeah, right, see you later, dude. Yep. <laughs> don't, don't call me again. So that's but, how but I used flipped. to be as well. Yeah, but it's flipped. It's flipped now. People it's are like, like, oh. I do Bitcoin. They're like, oh. Yeah, but tell me more. Yeah. Yeah, before I would say, people are oh, what do you do? Oh, I just, IT. Data centers. Yeah, IT. <laughs> oh. And then if they just stop there, okay, cool. I try to be the most boring four or five levels down before you get to Bitcoin. Because it'll inevitably be, oh, you're a criminal or, you know, what the fuck is that or Nerd. whatever. And now it's like, oh, yeah, iBit. I've heard of iBit. And yeah. now it's like a whole thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I think some of that is is the, just the mature narrative. Like the media aren't getting away with lying about it. Well, they used to. Yeah, of course they do. Community Notes has helped with that. But also we've just got proper journalists like McKenzie writing proper articles. Fun fact, McKenzie and I have the same exact birthday. Huh. Yep. I saw her this week. I did too. Yeah, I was on the phone and she like ran past me. I was like, Mackenzie. And the, I was on the phone to Connor. So I put her, because she's met Connor out in oh. Africa. Uh, I hope Mackenzie's listening. I oh, no, is it, I throw her in the bus with this? <laughs> Maybe I will. I, I don't care. I look forward to the day she's working for herself. She's fully independent, doing her own shit. Yeah. Not working for the man. Yeah. I think she's brilliant. She's genius. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> ran around circles. It's not embarrassing anymore. Um, and uh, But if we want to solve this problem with the, the miners, is there anything we can do? Like, Or is it just the economic incentives are America's going to keep taking hash rate? So I think the if we take the chip stuff aside, yeah, yeah. And just talk about miners and pools. I feel very confident in saying that miners... And mining companies will always seek the most inefficient market because that's where the alpha is, always. That by itself is a good enough decentralization incentive to keep that perpetuating. It's always been the case, so it will always be the case. Now, whether that's regulatory pressure or incentive to find cheaper power, I think the, <clears throat> you know, you're going to hear a lot at the in Oslo about all the stuff Gridless is doing and all the stuff. There's a lot of consumer products now, like the, the guys that heat bit, right? They make mm. that heater that's got a Bitcoin miner inside of it. There's going to be more and more consumer type products. There's going to be more and more people who are enthusiasts that just want to put something online. That's something that happened in 2019 that has never happened before. People spinning up lightning notes because they just wanted to learn. People buying crappy miners because they just wanted to put them online. You'll see more of that. Mm -hmm. So I think now the network is as far as machines and locations, been it's more diverse and more decentralized than it's ever been. So we have one risk, is a rogue federal government taking aim at this. And look, they did that EI, they tried, they put out that EIA thing, right? But You saw how quickly it was smashed, though. Yeah, everyone told them to fuck off, right? Yeah. Uh, so really, it sounds like the, the big thing is the pools. Full back circle to Matt Corallo. Um, what has been the issue with getting Stratum V2 rolled out? Because Matt is keen on that. Yeah. The brains guys keen yep. on that. Everyone says, "Yeah, no, it needs to happen." But you, as a miner, you're still using Stratum V1. Yeah. Why haven't you flipped? What, what's the work involved? Shout out Parker. There is no real incentive. So here's the way: ideally, V2 would be rolled out. The OEMs, Bitmain, What's Miner, Ardine, whoever, they need to integrate it on the hardware first. Because right now, all the implementations are kind of like a halfway there but that's extra work extra testing and what if they ship it and there's a problem and they don't make extra money from it right so it has to be an altruistic endeavor first what's involved with it though because for you to change pools you said it's like 100 milliseconds just point your hash rate elsewhere right. why isn't that the case with this is it just not like a block of code that says do x so to really get it into the hands where every miner can construct its own block template, you've got to bake it into the firmware on the miner. 
okay, but you don't have to do that. There is an alternative. Miners can do it. That's right. The second second level is the pool can facilitate a proxy where, so like demand pool, Ollie, they, they're doing this to allow you to kind of, they make a nice UI for you to do that, but that's still a point of centralization, right? So to really get it all the way through, it needs to be on the device. And then from there, anybody can use it or not. It's an opt-in, opt-out. The problem is it's not going to make me more money. It's going to be more tinkering to get it in to the device. And then the pool at the end of the day also has to accept those types of shares. Why would the pool re reject it? In order to make that big of a change to your pool, you've got to take the pool down. And so they'll have a failover, right? So the pool, the main pool is mining. They're going to put up another load. It's called a load balancer. Mm -hmm. It's mining here. They'll work on this one. They put this one in place. You don't actually know it works until you hit a block. So that risk is there. Right. So what is your biggest risk? One block. Yeah. Okay. Has, is anyone using Stratum V2 right now and it's working? So Brains has a closed source version that yeah. they're working on. I think they've hit some blocks with it. Okay. It is not the open source version. Uh, Ocean will probably be the next one if I had to guess. Okay. Nobody's denying that V2 is great for decentralization. It's just there's no incentive really right now. So it has to happen at pool level. The miner themselves can't activate it. That's right. The, you've got to have a place to send those V2 shares. Okay. And there isn't a pool at the moment except in V2 shares. Outside of brains. Okay, but so so if brains could do it, could they become a significant pool? Like how big is their pool? Uh, well, they 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 fell off a lot. So you know, slush was the first one turned into brains. They had 20 percent, but because they were one of the last holdouts for FPPS, they lost a lot of hash rate. So if a big miner said, you know what, we're going to uh, switch to stratum V two, and brains is working, and we want to point at that. Are they giving themselves more risk because the total hash power Brains has means they might get less blocks? No, I think, if anything, it's it's the inverse. It's oh, the okay. marketing strategy, you know? So I, I don't think there's any, there's no issue with it. It's the fact that a Bitmain device out of the box won't support it, mm -hmm. right? So you got to run it through a proxy. And then you got to run it from the proxy to the pool. Then, you know, a What's Minor device isn't going to support it. So you got to, You've got to get, and I've been having these conversations with these guys, like, can we just implement it? Like, we could donate dev cycles, whatever. Nobody said no. So I think towards the end of this year, you'll get some native OEM V2 stuff. And then the pools, that'll be the easy part. So you think it's coming? Yeah, yeah. You're not worried? It's just not going to happen tomorrow because nobody's getting paid to do it. But if no one's ever getting paid to do it, why at the end of the year? Uh, based on the conversations of having okay. manufacturers. All right. I've just called enough favors. Like, come on, let's get this done. Yeah, let's you know? get this done. Because yeah. I was thinking, like, do we need to get a round table, like public round table and say, look, let's get this fucking shit done. I heard you mention that. Yeah. You're going to get crucified. Why? That is exactly how I approach Classic. And no, I no, got no. nailed to a cross. Yeah, but you're trying to fork the Bitcoin. I'm trying to say, look, let's just not, let's keep Bitcoin decent. Heard of Sailor's Mining Council? Yeah, but I don't want a mining council. Well, oh, the uh, same shit. No, it's not mi mining. No, no, this is more like a roundtable podcast. Let's talk about it. Uh, Why? Podcast. You, yeah, like, okay. yeah, like, just get it public. So the yeah. reason I say that is Bobby Lee tried to do this, Satoshi Roundtable number two, during the classic block wars. It did not go well. No, I'm not thinking this as a governance thing. Okay. I'm thinking this is a public conversation. I see. It's like, we all benefit from this happening. It's not happening. Let's have a couple of miners. You know, a couple of, yeah, let's have Ardine, do you call them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and what's miner? And, you know, a couple of pools and say, what the fuck's stopping you? Yeah. Get on with this. Yeah. <laughs> Be a short podcast. Why aren't you doing Get the fuck on with it. Okay. Thanks for listening to what Bitcoin did. <laughs> Support my football team. That's right. I want right, to talk cool. about that, man. I, I, I will say uh, you've done a really great job of, putting your money where your mouth is. Well, I put so other people's you, money where my mouth is. Well, your, your own too. I so put my time where my mouth is. You got is. into Bitcoin, got your ass kicked early. Yep. Just like everybody does. Yep. I, mine was much earlier. Yep. Thank God. And then you learned. Yep. And you're fucking killing it. Ah, Football team, the bar, you're going to be fucking mayor of Bedford. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. The football team is 
is uh, I tell you what, you sounded like a fucking psycho when you're like, we're gonna fucking do it. Yeah, I, dude, no you're one believed me. Doing it, <laughs> no How one crazy. believed. Me. I was like, I'm gonna buy the. I, I've got to give credit to Cameron and Tyler here. Look, they get their asses kicked as well because their exchange does shit coins too. But the truth is, if you're in the exchange business, it's hard without shit coins. It's just truth is, it is. Yeah. You know, um, but whatever. I don't care. They've always been solid guys to me. Uh, I remember the first time I met them, and I called up Tyler. And I said, he gave me his number and he said, if you need anything, call me. I texted him, I spoke to him, I needed a favor. He said, I've got you. This guy's a fucking famous billionaire. He just gave me his time. By the way, I use Cameron and Tyler interchangeably because I still don't know which one is. Sorry if you're listening, guys. Uh, once they start talking, I know, but when I sit yeah. down, I don't. And I can't remember who said what. That's, I think it's fair. They're probably used to that. Anyway, I didn't have a plan to get Real Beverly in the Premier League. I had a plan to buy my local team and I just wanted to get them in the Football League, right? Which is the top four divisions. Right. Bedford's never had a team there. It's a large town. It's good. Anyway, I'm, I think we're in Texas, but it might have been Miami. And so I, I called them up. I said, like, do you want a beer? And they said, yeah. And they were sponsoring the pod at the time. I said, this is the renewal. They're like, cool. And I said, by the way, I've got this other idea. And I was like, I want to buy my local football team and get them in the football league. And they're like, just explain the structure. So I said, look, the football league is the, the four professional leagues. The team I want to buy is non-league. I want to get them up and create a professional team. I want to have them in the Bitcoin team. And uh, straight off the bat, he went, how'd you get them in the Premier League? Straight off the bat. And I was like, right, this team has 40 fans, a, a ground that's falling apart, um, and no infrastructure. You're basically saying, how do you take a brand new team from the bottom to the top? It's never, never been done. That's right. And so I was like, let me think about it. And so I realized, look, it's, it's a nine-figure thing to do. Sure. You need nine figures to do this or you need Bitcoin. And so I spent two years figuring out how to win leagues, done it, three goes, twice with the men, once with the ladies, we won three leagues. So I figured it out. And so the math is either give me 300 million, which is gonna melt away as I try and do it, or give me a small amount of Bitcoin, which if I don't spend, it might mean we do it. Throw in the fact that I've got international sponsors uh, and throw in the fact that I've got fans all around the world buying jerseys. I did a I did a podcast with Pomp yesterday. We had 10 orders on the website. That's making it work. I don't know. It's going to get harder every level, but I think it, the more the time goes on with this and more people realize, oh, holy shit, this could work. I looked at your deck. Oh, yeah, the one I put on Twitter. Your attendance chart. Yeah. Tells you everything you need to know. Well, that's the sustainability part. So yeah. the interesting part, and sponsorships are high at the moment. We tra we trend higher on sponsorships than anyone at our level, like a few divisions above, rightly so, because we've got international awareness as sure. a non-league football club. Yeah. But we track below where we want on attendances. But what's going to happen is our, our sponsorships aren't going to go much higher. They'll probably be flat for the next three, four years because we can't create more, that much more awareness. But our crowds should keep going up, which starts to plug that gap on the on the revenue model. Uh, it's, it's the best thing in the world. Like, and now with cheat code. Yes. Congrats. Thank you. I heard it was fucking awesome. You're coming next year. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there. You are, uh, you ate shit and now you're fucking crushing it. <laughs> so I just want to say good job, man. No, look, look. Um, I, you know, Michael, M Michael Peterson is the inspiration, right? He took a village in El Salvador, a beachside village that no one had ever heard of, and made it a destination. What a psycho. Yeah. Incredible. He, he made it a destination. He made it a Bitcoin place that made it a destination, that sparked a revolution, that sucked in all the Bitcoiners, and then Malas, the absolute fucking legend, goes down there, goes to the president. How like, fucking insane is that story? He's like, yo. Yo, what up, dude? I was fucking in El Salvador at the time. Yo, what up, dude? Crazy. Make Bitcoin legal tender. Bukele's like, fuck, let's go. And now we have a legal tender country. And so you, you, you know, it's, what do they say about um, standing on the shoulder of giants? Michael Peterson's a fucking giant. Yeah. And I'm standing on his shoulders going, okay, can, can I do what you did there here? Right, I'll do that and I'll do it with football and then I'll do it with a conference and then I'll make us the Bitcoin town and then I'll become the mayor and then I'll become the king. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Look, I love Here's it, the man. interesting part though because El Salvador had their own challenges. Yeah. But you've got a different set of challenges. You've got these old white-haired losers and there's a big part of you, because I know you, that's like, yeah, fuck you guys. No, no, I'm fucking And you're you just, guys. the best part about Bitcoin is the way you're leveraging it. 
Mm. You don't need permission from anybody. No. Just keep doing your thing. Well, these 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 people who these bureaucratic government workers yeah. are used to people asking for permission. Yeah. I don't think they're used, for, used to somebody in the town going, oh, fuck you, I know what I want anyway. I don't right. care what you say. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to run for mayor. Three years. Nice. Um, what yeah. do you reckon your odds are? Depends. Uh, it depends. If I if I go with a party, I think I got it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll win it. Because I've got enough local support now. I've done enough good things. If I go independent, I just don't know. I, I could get crushed or I still might do it, but I could right. get crushed. And so that that's the thing I don't know. Um, and that's the decision to make. But, you know, if I go, I've, I've, I've got to make the decision in a year and it, and then the campaigning will be for two years. But also I can't really do the job. So I'm going to make my brother do the job. Now, is it the same in the States where you're not going to win unless you raise the most money? No, it's none of that. Okay. No, I don't, I don't need the money. I need the publicity and the party support. Yeah. If I have publicity and party support locally, yeah. And it wouldn't cost a lot. You know, local campaigning. It's a lot of knocking on doors and oh. you're doing events and going to schools. What's the population of Bedford? 174,000. Okay. I don't even vote. I mean, you, you might be something pathetic like you get 20% turnout oh. and that 20% might be people who old people who turn out and they always pick the same party they pick. Right, right, right. And to swing the vote might be... You got to spur the youngsters. Yeah, yeah, just, just, I might be able to like swing the vote just because of local popularity. Right. But I, but, but I'm, my agenda will be like nothing they're, they're used to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's like cut, cut spend, cut waste. Uh, and and I, I want to put cameras and everything, film the whole thing so the public can see exactly what's going on. Here's all the bullshit. Here's where they're wasting money. So you're going to go on melee type? Yeah. 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 And look, I, you know, I'd probably need like a, an Eric Voorhees to be my consultant say, Pete, <laughs> this is what you need to do here. And there'll be unpopular things. You know, you're sure. going to cut some of the commie spend and sure. they're not going to like it. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe. And and your take on the recent... <sighs> uh, so my take on Trump is... I've got one thing I care about, Free Ross. Yeah. Free Ross... And look, if he goes in and you know, brings some legislation, which is energy neutrality and you know, right to self-custody, awesome. But outside of that, I mean, they're all the same. Yeah. Like, I'm not getting sucked into it. Yeah. Um, I would just say, and I would be a, if I was here to be a single issue voter, free Ross would swing my vote. I'd gamble that vote on getting that to happen. And then you hope you get Assange and Snowden and that afterwards. Right. And then that starts to see a, a swing. I think there's an interesting thing in politics. I think politics lag lags behind the public. But eventually, politics has to catch up with the public. The public distrust is growing, but there are people who still think their party is going to solve it. I think you need a growing uh, a group of people who are disenfranchised with the whole thing and refusing to vote. Troy Cross is a good example. Yeah, you've got to yeah. be disenfranchised with the whole thing and refusing to vote. You want low voter turnout, yeah. not high, yeah. and you want the message, and then you want people to become... I don't... Look, the Bitcoin fixes it with politics. I don't think we end up anarchist. Yeah. Um, and, and even though I'm falling down that libertarian rabbit hole and they're all assholes, um, I think the way... I was saying to you earlier, I think the way Bitcoin fixes it is my example locally. Like... Once Bitcoin goes over 100K, I'm probably at the point where I, I don't become a politician to make money. And I think the problem with most politicians is it's a good it's a good way to make money, right? Or it's a good way to get popular or famous. All those things. Yeah, in Bedford, I don't need the money from the job, and I don't need the notoriety. So the only reason to do it is to go and do a good job. So if if you get more people becoming politicians because they don't need the notoriety and they don't need the money, maybe they're actually going to do do good things. And if we can get more Bitcoiners in political positions, then maybe that's the shift we get. And I, I could be, that could be hopium, but yeah, you know, a lot of rich Bitcoiners who've got yeah, I've more got the money. other side. Huh? I uh, this is not a popular take, okay. but in general, I don't give two shits. I think it's it's not red versus blue; it's red and blue versus you. Yeah, you know, I'm a tenth generation Texan. I don't give a fuck. You can come. I've got more guns than anybody. Like I'm not worried about any of that. <laughs> And I haven't voted since 2008. I don't plan to vote. So I'm more of a opt out, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of people, oh, that's so selfish, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I work my fucking ass off so I can be selfish. Yeah, but like, I agree with you. Your federal level, our like national level, I'm not going to vote Rishi or Keir. They're fucking idiots, all of them. Yeah. I don't care. But at a local level where I can maybe become an elected mayor and make change, I'll do that. 
that's a dip that for me i like that at the local level I see. start to drive influence uh but no i don't care don't trust any of them yeah um yeah fuck them <laughs> right marshall good to see you brother pleasure as always and give back my hoodie <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening everybody thanks